Yeah, this is the old railway building that is now the bus transit and maxi taxi hub. We gathered here on the 26th of February 1970. We were proceeding from here with a car, with a microphone, and our destination was the, ha the Canadian High Commission, just a matter of a stone throw away. We marched along South Key, and when we reached at this point, we stopped. That building is now the Ministry of Legal Affairs. But in 1970, the upper floor was the Canadian High Commission. We came here to be able to tell them what we wanted to tell the world, that Canada is also a racist country. If I asked you to give a message to the people of my country, Canada, what would it be? I would tell them to beware. Black people down here are on the move. We are aware of what is being done to our brothers in Canada, and we intend to take serious, positive action if those boys do not get justice. From here, we went to Abercrombie Street to make the block. We went into the Royal Bank of Canada to the demand to see where black people were working. All you were seeing were white employees. I came in down a little late and went to the bank and uh, Scotia Bank and observed a crowd just across the street at, at the Royal Bank. And as I came over and realized there was a bustle of police in riot gear. And there seemed to be some kind of scuffle to get into the bank. The police came and then Mackendall Dagger turned up and immediately took command of the whole thing. And I said, well, this is a very good story, you know, this is, this is something unusual happening here. I don't know whose bright idea it was, but all of a sudden everybody decided to head east along what is now called Independence Square. And uh, in no time at all, we were all in the cathedral. Demonstrators poured into the two entrances, to the front and to the side came into the church, sat down on pews and so on, walking around. And two priests came out to talk with them and they dragged the microphone inside the, and a, a speaker inside the church and had a, a, a meeting inside the church. And two police officers stood up guarding the altar to make sure they don't uh, come up there for some reason. They must have been Catholic police officers. <laughs> the young men going into the cathedral would have been going in spontaneously. They would have been going in, born out of that sense that this whole business of a white god was somehow not something that they could deal with anymore. I said, if you walk into a church, so when you look around, you can't see one black saint, then you know you have no place there. Now, how are you going to tell the people who have been told that you were the first people on the face of the earth, right? And that you were so thousands of years before other people. And suddenly, you have heaven been portrayed on your walls, and there's not one black person, which means they say all these years passed and we never did anything good to get into heaven. Two of the demonstrators with black shirts took their shirts and put it over two statues, that of Peter and the Virgin Mary with Jesus, saying that we want a black Jesus. We left, it was two o'clock. And I remember that because two o'clock news, Radio Trinidad, Winston Maynard, contacting the Archbishop of Port of Spain, Anthony Pantin, and asking him for a comment on the desecration of the cathedral. And Archbishop Pantin answered saying, from all the reports he have received, he do not see that there was any desecration. So that when people talk desecration, you know, of course people had to fuel that with all kinds of exaggerations. As far as I know, the kinds of, um, urinating on the altar and all that sort of thing. That didn't happen. What you had was people traipsing up and down <laughs> the altar, now with, with flags and so on. Now, depending on how you look at it, that could be seen as desecration because some people have a sense of the holy of holies. The demonstrators were just growing in numbers. You just saw streams of people coming from Lavantil Hill, 
the response by Archbishop was the trigger. But it could have only been the trigger because it fell on fertile ground. So it became larger. And we went to go down to Frederick Street. Upon reaching Park and Frederick, the newspapers estimated some 10,000. As we began down Frederick Street, we saw the Syrians beginning to close their shops. And they would stand outside various stores, you know, and accuse, they would point at the white mannequins in the store windows. And so you see, they wouldn't even put black, they're selling you clothes of black people who have white mannequins in the windows and so on. And this, this is the rhetoric that began to develop. The outcome of that day, that historic day, I want to say, 26th of February, 1970, was in late night and the wee hours of the morning, a number of the leaders of the movement. He said, we're going to stand those the night, my night mass, candlelight vigil, and we're going to have bus glass pain. But we didn't cater for the fact that some of the glass pain was older than we. So some of the glass is six inches thick and all kind of thing. There was old building. There's not, there's not no new San Fernando. San Fernando was a historical perspective. Boy, the first set of brick we threw at them glass, the glass really tell me we weren't taking that, you know, and mash up the brick on them and the glass won't crack. So men now take up um, Pigfoot and run in and start to beat the people glass, and the glass won't crack. We give up and say, hey, let me just march. We just go take because we would have been, if we come out about seven, all quarter past nine, we reach Benetton Street yet, and that's the first block. Not near break, all we brick mash up, all kind of. So we say, well, it left it. But as there was a policeman in charge of the, the riot squad, a fellow named Sergeant Lee, so call him Barra Lion. If Bagalan come up to you in a group, you're holding a meeting on that street light, and he say, what happening, fellas? You're all right. But if Bagalan come up to the group and say, gentlemen, start to run. Granger would lead them to places like Federation Park and, you know, point out all the big, rich houses and say, look at how these people are living, you know. And of course, some of these people who came from Laventil and so on, this was quite an eye-opener. They had never seen, you know, lawns and swimming pools and that kind of thing. They'd never seen that sort of thing before. And the vi sporadic violence would break out from time to time. I'm not sure if this was, I don't think this was orchestrated by Granger. I think there were individuals who had their own access to grind and who would, you know, throw the occasional Molotov cocktail or whatever. And the pressure continued on Eric Williams to crack down on this thing. You better join the marching because at least you're sure where them is. So they're going to throw, they will throw a multiple cocktail among themselves. But they go through in people's house who they feel is scab, who they feel is, 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 is um, boss friend, that's how they get work and thing. They go through multi multi cocktail in them house. So the safest thing to do was to march in the hot sun, nothing can happen there. And it was very worrying, okay, okay. particularly when the um, movement moved from the university into Woodford Square. And in every few days, there was big gatherings in Woodford Square, and then um, moving out of Woodford Square to parade in the streets, and even into residential areas, which caused um, wives to be very upset, so much so that some of the foreign wives moved out shortly after and went back to the different countries that they had come from. Do you think that uh, the use of violence has uh, brought any good in this current situation? Yeah, I think it has done a lot of good because the Canadians recognized that the people down here were serious and that we were concerned about our black brothers up there. Any action using any means necessary to see that justice is had. We are very angry. It's, we have gone beyond the point of dissatisfaction. Woodford Square, we renamed it the People's Parliament because as far as the country was concerned, generally, that parliament had become redundant. And it was a People's Parliament with the people participating. Here's where we gathered. 
at times hundreds, at times thousands. On the bandstand, you would have the PA system, uh, you would have banners, and uh, most times they were meeting for three, four hours before March would take place. If they would foot square with a, a political rally or a meeting, right, I pass in by the square to catch some of that. I can't stay for the whole thing because I got to reach home within a regular kind of time so my parents and I mean go feel nothing. We had to sort of be very surreptitious about going to meetings and, and going to the square, listening to speeches and so on. The last speaker at all our meetings was McCandle as the leader. The demonstrators would be told that this was a disciplined march, that people were to be of their best. Also that people must not take anything that don't belong to them. And that if we reach some place in which they want things to eat or they must know that they have to pay for it. The movement speakers were like marathon runners, right? Speak very long. So I pass by the square and I listen to the speakers and you know I hope well the police and mash it up because a lot of the times once the people assemble and, and the, the speakers start to fire, you'll find that the, the, the police on many occasions would come and mash up the rally, you know, just when things begin to wax. There are times they would cut the current out and the people as on cue would remain exceedingly silent and the speakers will continue and throw their voices and the cathedral assisted greatly. There was acoustics there, so the uh, sound was bouncing in the cathedral and also coming back. And when I hear the speakers on them, it has some real fiery um, speakers. The orators on them was, was top of the line, you know, when you listen to uh, Macandal Daga and, 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 and these guys on them talk, Clive Nunez and them, and them for us talk, you know, it used to, it used to, it used to fire you up, you know, um, putting things in perspective. The rhetoric was very strong. We felt very strongly about what we believed in. We felt strongly in what, about what we were fighting for. We felt very strongly about what we were fighting against. And it was expressed in the rhetoric. There was no um, Nambi Pambi rhetoric in, 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 in 1970. Listening to the, the voices of those people on the, on the loudspeakers during those days, it was exciting. Now, they were not speaking about taking over the government or anything, you know. They were addressing ideas about inequality. The fact that after getting independence from Britain, that this, the status quo hadn't changed. That um, black people, African people, were still not given equal opportunity, and East Indians. And that the upper classes still enjoyed the best out of society. Some people try to pretend all of we is one. Um, I, I just think that is nonsense. All of we may like to be one, but the thing is that people are very conscious of racial and ethnic, ethnic differences. We didn't deal with it by saying all of we is one. You look at the banners of 1970, it says Indians and Africans unite now. So far as NJAC was concerned, they very genuinely thought that if you were not white, then, then, then you were black. That's how the world, they said, regarded us so that they had some difficulty in understanding the Indian reluctance to be, to, to be called black. And therefore Indians then, and even now, certainly have a problem with, 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 with being called black. So that um, if they are to join the struggle in a serious way, we have to devise a sufficiently neutral term that takes into consideration the historical antagonism and, and possibly devises words that, that, are, that are neutral and applicable to, to everybody. There was an incident where 12 Indians were burnt alive in Sawa. I can't, I can't even remember the circumstances. And the paper started to project it as if it the black poem did that. Right. So the alienation of the Indian from the struggle began with the, with the press. Right. And that, again, right, is so absolutely essential that we have to go to Karani, right, to demonstrate to the people in Karani that what you're reading in the papers is not what Anjak is about. The entire establishment tried to prevent that march. That was the most frightening march to them because so far the marches are taking place mainly in the north. And 
they didn't know what would happen with the march coming to Central Trinidad. So there were many efforts to stop it. Threats came to us that they would have gunmen in the cane fields and we'd be endangering people's lives. And even people call up saying there were police, senior police and this and that, and you know, call our homes and tell us, you know, this is dangerous and this and that. And we let them know, well, we're more dangerous. During a speech in Woodford Square when he was announcing the march to Kearney, Geddes Granger invited Archbishop Panton to join the march. Now, there had been some concern in the Catholic Church because of the invasion of the cathedral on February 26th that black power was anti-Catholic. So Granger decided to make a concession to this. He said, well, let, let Archbishop Pantin join us. And Archbishop Pantin, God rest his soul, agreed that he would go on the march. And as he said to me at the point in time, because I interviewed him, well, I will help keep things moderate, you know, my presence and make sure that there's no trouble and so on. But on the day of the march, he didn't turn up. And when I investigated, as it turned out, that a lot of the priests in the church appealed to him not to go because they said you're going to drive the church into a political into a political affair and we don't want that i believe there might have been some pressure from the government as well from eric williams in, in particular when would reach to the we were there when we would reach to the prime minister that the archbishop anthony pantin had agreed to join the caroni march williams went to work right away he was very concerned about the Archbishop involvement in that match. And the emissary was Sir Ellis Clark, heavy Catholic man. These are the things that happened. But yeah, we got people concerned. In the initial stages, I think he felt nothing about going. At least it was natural for him to go. Um, but along the road, and um, you hear different views on that, um, people felt that, listen, one, there was a danger to his own life, which I gather at one point became a major consideration for him. Um, and then, of course, if you identify with this particular group, where does it leave you as Archbishop of Port of Spain? Um, but I think his heart was still in the purpose of the march, you know, so that when he spoke to us later on, there was a sense of disappointment that he had not been able to be there in his view, with and for the least of his brothers and sisters. And even as he was about to die, he told me he's dying with one regret, that he ever did that. And that match, the match to Kayani, oh, that was a big one, that was a huge one. You know, but you know I couldn't make the whole distance because of what I do, ended up in Kayani as a schoolboy. But I catch a little piece, you know, and when they turn, to, they turn by the beat them, they go in, i done with that, you know, I had to come out there. I was very surprised that as we marched along the southern main road through the Indian villages, there was no hostility. In fact, um, lots of Indians came out with, with, with water, bottles of water, jugs of water, raising their hands in the, in the Black Horse salute because, because, because they, they sensed that our people should, should come together. It was beautiful with the reception. We dealt with the sugarcane industry. We dealt with all the things that affected them. And um, the meeting finished quite late. And then we discovered that we had carried the meeting too long. There was no transport. So it meant you either had to develop <laughs> the energy to decide to walk to town, which was not an easy thing to think of. And something happened there that I will always, always, always remember. The Indians volunteered to take demonstrators to their homes. Now, when an Indian could accept you into his home, where his wife and daughters may be, and feed you, and allow you to sleep there, that's love. Normally, people don't take those chances, right? Because you don't know who you're taking there. All you're just a human being. And that prevailed. And they got up in the morning, and they went for transport. And they used all means of transport, whether it's bike, truck, car, whatever it is, and took them all into town. 
interestingly enough, being involved in that in that particular march was very interesting because at that time issues of of um, of race were very prominent. You know, uh, whites were considered to be the enemies in a sense, and therefore the question of black and white was very 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 clear cut. And therefore, being in, in the march to Karani was really quite a a feat <laughs> for me, um, uh, undoubtedly. But I'll tell you this, I'll tell you a, st a quick story of that. Uh, when we were going through the Karani village, uh, at that time there was, the, of course, you know, there were the, the, the marches were very hev heavily under surveillance. And there were some little diff difficulties along the way. And, st and the, 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 so to some extent, the march is getting a little bit disorganized. And uh, Daga, well, Geddes at the time, uh, came back and he saw me and he said, Ivan, you have to help me organize the students. So that, uh, because he knew I was a student at the university at the time and involved in, in the, in the uh, activities, and I'm saying, here am I being asked as a white man to be able to help organize students in a black power demonstration. But you see, in the heat of those activities, when you're involved in things of that kind, in the way that we were at that stage, <clears throat> the question of color sometimes just dissipates and you're seen as just another Caribbean human being. Now what we did, we mapped out the Trinidad and Tobago and I think it ended up in about 12 divisions. And in each division, we then organized a demonstration to comb that area. What we have to understand is that Tobago was different from Trinidad in terms of the population makeup. The racial composition of Tobago was basically to almost totally African, so that it was easier to mobilize an island like Tobago so that um, the movement would have impacted um, faster and quicker in a place like Tobago. Okay, the first major march took place on the 4th of April. It stopped first at a nightclub where they were using young black girls, 13 and 14 years of age, to perform striptease for the tourists. Uh, from there, we went to Bacalet Bay, which was completely barred off by the um, hotel, which was owned by the Swedish. And um, we were not allowed, as young persons growing up in Tobago, we were not allowed to bathe at Bacalet Bay. From there, we went down to Mount Irving. The reason for the Mount Irving march was to emphasize the situation that existed where you had a massive well-watered golf course being foreign owned yet the village next to it heavily populated Bethel was without water. From there I said we went to Pigeon Point to reclaim Pigeon Point for, to, for the people of Tobago because even there we were denied um, access without having to, without pain. We were met at the the gate was there blocking us out, so some, one guy stood at one side of the gate, another guy stood at another side of the gate, and they took out the gate and threw it in the sea, and we proceeded to march to Pigeon Point. But when we approached the beach, the police lined in front of the beach with guns and riot stuff and so on, and um, asked to say, you can't go there. So, Get this Granger now, Macandal Dagger, in a piece of brilliance, he said, well, we'll divide the demonstration into five. And then he said, well, forward. And we proceeded to move forward to the police, and they broke ranks. And we proceeded to bathe in Pigeon Point to symbolize, well, look, the sea should belong to all people. On the 18th was the final demonstration, which was the one to Charlottesville. It would be a tough march, 27 miles from Scarborough to Charlottesville, up hills and down hills and so on. But what I can remember is that um, the, the challenge of making that journey. At one point, one of the, the demonstrators started to chant, walk, black man, walk, walk, black man, walk, you know, to, to motivate. That was the kind of thing. The villagers came out in their thousands, and as, as we moved through the streets, more and more just fell in. So that by the time we reached Charlottesville, there would have been possibly about 12 to 15,000 persons there. And Dago led that one from start to finish. You know, he walked the entire distance. 
Marching is a very effective weapon. But you must ensure that you are building and not dwindling. And I saw what was happening. I see that it was going to become an ineffective weapon. The movement was dying out. I was following the marches and the historic, that historical event, the unfortunate shooting of Basil Davis by the police ignited it, reignited it into a proportion that we had not seen before. Now this word is me, and I am this word, so let my voice be heard. Fix your hearing aid and hear what I say. Wipe your glasses and see things my way. This gate is the gate in which Basil Davis was brought by two police. That incident was the police arrested a known corrector in the city by the name of Charlie. The song that you hear is an angry one. And I am sure if you are seeing things clear, you will see that all happiness is gone. Well, the police arrested Charlie saying they're going to charge him for using obscene language. And a number of young people were in the square and Basil Davis, who was a demonstrator, we never knew him before, he began to follow the police and say, let go, Charlie, let go, Charlie. And then the dogs, the dogs are barking too long. It's a sign, a sign that something is wrong. And the police, they apparently became afraid and they decided to arrest Basil Davis. So they arrested him and bringing him through there, this gate. Because every day I wait in this country, I see signs of poverty. The money system getting so dread that some people have to beg their bread. To take him to the old police headquarters. And upon reaching here, that's the report that he moved towards the fence from the police, two policemen who was holding him on, and he buckled himself like that. Well, not to go. And at some point, one of the policemen, Corporal Joshua Gordon, who would normally be in plain clothes, pulled out a .25 German Beretta and shot Basil Davis. Here, the bullet, based on the autopsy report, struck the pelvic bone and came back up to his heart. The people took him up. Well, he staggered onto the roadway around this area here. And people took him up, put him in the car. So hark, hark, the dogs do bark. The beggars are coming to town. Beggars in rags, beggars in tags, beggars in their velvet gown. The rest of the leadership was in Tobago. Macandal, Kafra, a number of them holding some meetings over there for a couple of days. And they were coming back six that afternoon. So I went to Piaco and met them, telling them what has happened. And I said, Brother Granger, who is now McCandle, uh, we must make this a state funeral. I know Basil Davis was from my community, and, and so that funeral, that march, um, came out of East Dry River and went, went, went along the Eastern Main Road. Um, I remember leaving home the morning. Um, I didn't think we had school that day. And I leave home the morning. They say that we had a red, a red, um, red band. Right? So I leave home the morning. And I tell my parents and them, well, I go in the library and study. Uh, I duck in by the pharmacy and I buy a, red, a, a piece of red ribbon. And I tie it on my hand and I'm ready to march. You know, and I take a little piece of that march again up the eastern main road. And when I find out, I reach fine enough and think that, you know, I could handle my stories. But I think, I, duck, I think that march went to Sawar, to Sawar Cemetery, up Sawar Hill. You know, but I didn't make the distance with them because, as I say, I always had one, one eye to look out for the police, the other eye to look out for my father. And they said something like 100,000 people marched 
I mean, people came from everywhere in Trinidad into that march. And it was such a massive expression of people against police brutality and against the, the idea that you would shoot down somebody on account of their interest in wanting to be on the streets, you know, to demonstrate what was a very legitimate concern. It is the biggest funeral I've ever seen in my life. And I was standing by Angostura. The leaders were on a truck, Dabo, Joe Young, Kai Munez, with these Castro Berets, Berets, and they, they waved to me. And it reminded me of Fidel Castro's triumphant return from the Syrian mountains in Cuba to when he marched into Havana and with overthrew for Nacio Batista. And they were power to the people, power to the people. But they saw me, I waved to them. Okay. And uh, I experienced something on that memorable day. A police vehicle was proceeding from east to west on the eastern main road. And when the police vehicle reached Mohan Junction, the Enjak security signaled them to stop. They stopped and told them they cannot proceed west. And the police vehicle Divert, accepted the orders and swing right into Lady Young Road. And I called Dr. Williams at his home. I said, Chief, this thing's serious. This is a massive thing. At that point in time, people thought this thing is going to get violent because there's going to be revenge against the police. There was a fear that violence would lead to more violence.